you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 17, once more, starting in verse 8. Exodus 17, verse 8 through 16, the scripture will also be on the screen above, and I want to invite you to follow along, please. Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16, here now, the word of the Lord. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So he took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying a hand on the throne of the Lord the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is God's word. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we receive your word by faith. Help us to trust that the battle is, is yours and in trusting to fight. Lord Jesus, we remember today, this day, your resurrection, your triumph over the grave. Help us to walk in that great victory. Holy Spirit, empower your church, empower us to walk together that we might also fight the good fight together. God, as you are one, we, we seek you as one. Your people, we worship you in your word today. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Uh, real quick, just a reminder, we do have the notes, which is basically an outline of the sermon and a few texts that we'll be referencing outside of our main text. If you want a copy of those notes, raise your hand. Uh, the ushers can run it out. We have just one up front here and one back there and one over here. <laughs> also, uh, we have clipboards and crayons with uh, cakey notes. So uh, it's little sections where they can draw or write down what they're hearing, questions they might have, and then the ways in which God would call us to respond, what God wants us to do um, according to his word. So Kiki's grab those notes and draw, and then you can talk to mom and dad about them later. All right, at, um, at our church's Thursday night jujitsu ministry, didn't, didn't know we had that, now you know. Uh, <laughs> this past week we had the blessing of a black belt come and share some instruction with us. You can tell I'm excited about this. This is my thing. Um, and as he instructed us, he reminded us that in fight sports, just like jujitsu, the small details can make a big difference. The more you know about the way an opponent reacts, the, the more knowledge and practice you have of the different tools at your disposal, then you'll last longer, you'll be more effective, you'll fight better. Well, today, God's people learn to fight. That's what we see in this section. As we've studied in Exodus, we've seen um, that it's a story by which we can understand our own story as God's people today. Uh, today, we see Israel's very first fight, their first war, their first battle as a nation. And here's what we need to understand. Just as the salvation of Israel was by God's gracious, uh, sovereign hand alone, so too... Right? Our salvation, our deliverance from Satan and sin and death are by God's sovereign hand, by God's grace alone. 
But as we see in Israel's story today, their journey involved both the trusting and receiving of that victory as well as actively obeying, actively striving, fighting the good fight. And church, likewise, our pilgrimage as God's people today includes times when we'll need to work, when we'll need to strive, when we'll need to fight. Um, 1 Timothy 6.12, this should be in your notes, puts it like this. Fight the good fight of faith. There it is. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So here's Paul. He speaks of faith in Christ. How? As a fight. He used language of effort, right, to obtain the full experience of that salvation. This is the journey for all who have confessed faith in Christ Jesus as Lord, as Savior, as Son of God. And so we live in this tension today, right? Uh, kind of an already not yet tension. Christ is risen. We, we just sung about that. Christ has ascended. That means he rules and reigns over all things. He's sovereign. He's, he's the Lord. That's what we mean. Um, by the way, that's why we gather on Sundays. It's to remember that day, the third day, when Christ rose, which was a Sunday. It's a, it's a weekly reminder that Jesus has the victory, that we're his people, that the battle has already been won. All who believe already possess victory, eternal life, and that promise of, of life forever. But here's the thing, in that tension of already, not yet, we, we, um, before we reach that heavenly rest, as we follow Jesus today, we still need to learn how to fight. And that's what we see in our text today. We need to learn how to fight, and we won't succeed alone. God gives us his people as we work together in unity, and so we must not turn away from God. We must not turn on one another like Israel did at, at Massa and Meribah. We must not fight against each other. We need to trust the holy God together. We must fight the good fight of faith together. Okay, so that's kind of the big idea here. Just to catch us up, we've been moving a little slowly through this section in Exodus, uh, chapters 15 through 18, and we've de detected this kind of pattern, right? Trials, grumbling, and then God's mercy and deliverance. Um, and they're, they're going from Egypt, where God saved them out of Egypt, the Exodus, and they're moving towards Mount Sinai. And so we're, we see this pattern unfolding in, in their wilderness travels. So here we are um, in Exodus 17. Uh, a couple weeks back, we looked at verses 1 through 7, and we saw internal battles, in, internal struggles. See, as Israel failed to trust God, and then they turned on, on Moses, right? So that section served as a warning, right? Don't test God, don't uh, grumble against one another, but trust God to provide not only for that daily need, but for our deepest need in Christ, right? To trust Christ, who is the rock. Now, for the first time, Israel is facing uh, attacks from the outside, from without. We have these cruel uh, desert raiders. That's basically what we know about the Amalekites. They were distant cousins of uh, Israel, and they were just notorious for being mean, wicked, cruel, desert people. So how would God deliver them this time? How would they uh, turn from him? Uh, I'm sorry, would they turn from him? Would they turn on one another again? Or would Israel finally begin to learn their lesson? And that's what we see here, rather than grumbling against Moses, they rally around him, and then God overcomes the enemy. So the big idea today is very simple. Fight the good fight of faith together. Fight the good fight of faith together. We're kind of, um, the main theme has been trusting God together, and one of the ways we do that is to fight the good fight together. Okay, two headings today. We must fight the fight, and second heading, we must fight together. Okay, fight the fight, fight together. And that's my prayer, is that as we face many, many trials from within and without, we'll find strength, we'll find encouragement as we fight the good fight together, as we rally together around Christ, who is our, our banner, who is our Lord, okay? So let's dive in. Number one, the first thing we need to know is that we must, as the people of God, fight it's going to be a fight. It's not going to be always easy. And that's the first thing we see is that as Israel followed God, they needed to fight. The Israelites, first thing you need to know, the Israelites were not fighters. 
Do you remember what they did for 400 years about? They were farmers and they built buildings. They built storehouses. They were not, here's the point, they were not equipped to fight. Do you ever feel like that? All the challenges around us, how, how, God, am I going to keep on fighting? None of the Israelites had ever fought a war before. For hundreds of years, they farmed, they built buildings, they didn't know how to fight, they weren't looking for a fight, but the fight found them. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. That's verse 8. In a similar way, as we live for Christ, battles are going to come our way. That's just a, a reality, that's just a fact. Not only opposition from those who are opposed to God in the world, but perhaps even more so, we'll fight bitterly against our own flesh, our own sin, our own wicked desires and temptations. And the Bible points out, actually, that the true battle is against spiritual forces as well. There's lots of enemies. To be a Christian is to join the fight. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but let's move on. So first, Israel is not well-equipped to fight that battle. But second, Israel's enemy was especially vicious. The enemies were dangerous, scary. We're told a little bit more about the enemy's evil tactics in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 to 18. This should be in your notes, but listen to this. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. Here's what that means. They were vicious. They were, they were terrible enemies. They preyed upon Israel when they were exhausted, tired. It's like kicking them when they're down. They went for uh, vulnerable ones. That's what it means. They cut off the tail. They, they preyed upon those that were weak and that, that lagged behind, uh, the sick, the elderly. And it says that they had no fear of God. That describes this arrogant attitude, attitude of, of cruelty. Amalek seemed to epitomize what it means to be enemies of, of God. Uh, later on in, in, in their Israel's history, we know that they would be a, a constant, uh, perpetual enemy towards Israel. But that's, that's kind of the idea here. Amalek almost symbolizes, ep epitomizes what it means to be the enemy of God, like, like the serpent and his seed back in Genesis 3.15 that God said would always be at enmity with the seed of the woman. So that's playing out as we see here in Amalek. You could even say Amalek represents the original enemy of God. So God's people, they're not impressive. The enemy was ruthless. Doesn't look good. They have to fight. That's the first takeaway. Okay. Second heading. See, we're moving quick here. Second, they had to learn not only to fight, to expect it, to not be surprised by it, but they had to learn to fight the fight together, to fight in the same direction, to fight for the same banner. See, here's what we see. Despite their shortcomings, despite the strength of the enemy, God still won. And he did it, how? Through his people together. Very simple, right? But that's what we see first. It was through Moses' leadership, but not by his own strength. In verse 9, Moses called upon Joshua to gather an army, and he would go up on that hill, take the staff. And Joshua went, and in verse 11, it says that when Moses' hands uh, with his staff was held high, Israel would win. When it dropped, Amalek would win. But in verse 12, Moses' own strength, we learn, just runs out. His, his hands begin to drop. They begin to falter. And God doesn't care. He doesn't win by the strength of Moses alone. That's what we see. Second, the victory is won through the help of others. Again, very basic. But notice, everybody played their part. Aaron, uh, this is Moses' brother and her, possibly uh, the husband of Miriam, Moses' sister. They went up the hill with him. Uh, they held up. Moses' arms as he sat on that stone. What a, what a picture, right? So that the staff could be raised all throughout the battle. In verse 13, it says that Joshua, as a result of, of that staff being held high, overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Okay, so here's the picture. 
It's all working together. Moses led, Aaron and her helped, and Joshua overcame Amalek. Okay, that's, that's the idea here. The victory was won through the help of others playing their part. But third observation here, ultimately, and this is, this is what is trying to, what is communicated in this passage, uh, ultimately, who won the victory? Who's, uh, when was it? Well, it was the Lord's. Remember, Moses brought with him up that hill that staff. What did that staff represent? This, this is a recurring theme throughout the rest of, um, of Exodus, right? And, and what we saw in the deliverance of Israel. The staff represented judgment and power of God. That, that was the point, right? It's by God's power that they won the victory through the means of his people fighting the good fight together, looking to the power of God to overcome. Um, we know this because what, what was the name of that memorial that they built, that memorial altar after the battle was won? What did they name it? Verse 15, the Lord is my banner. Yahweh, the Lord, is my banner. Uh, the banner or the flag is a symbol of victory. It, it was also used as a rallying point, right, for the armies to, to rally together to fight. And the banner pointed to Yahweh. Yahweh is the banner, his ultimate victory over his enemies and over his people's enemies. Verse 14 says, to utterly blot them out. A complete victory belongs to the Lord. As I mentioned later, throughout Israel's history, Amalek would constantly be an enemy towards God's people. And so God promised that he wouldn't stop until they were fully overcome. And his people could remember this victory with that altar Right, called the Lord is my banner. And as they remember, they could trust that God would take that ultimate victory, that, that it was as good as won. Okay, you see the picture? This is a very simple illustration of fighting the fight together. So let me just draw out some implications here and draw out some application, and we'll close. Church, do you see it? Okay, this maps onto our story. This maps onto the, the story of the people of God, just as Israel was to remember that victory and to live in light of it from generation to generation. They think back about that banner, about that altar, and the way that the Lord overcame the enemy. Even when they were weak and vulnerable, even though the enemy was vicious, they're to remember that victory and live in light of that from generation to generation. You see how that relates to us today? See the analogy for us? We live in light of God's Victory, an ultimate triumph. Every single Sunday, this is what we're remem reminding ourselves of, victory, victory. Jesus has won the victory over the greatest enemies of God and his people, right? Satan, sin, death. And how does he do this? Through the cross and the empty tomb, through Jesus. Here's what he did. The Son of God defeats sin by taking to himself humanity, I'm already getting hyped up for Christmas. That's, that's what we remember, right? That's when he came down to rescue us, humanity. And as fully God, fully man, he fulfills all righteousness for us, does the law perfectly, okay? And then he takes the penalty for us on the cross. He defeated death and Satan and sin by rising on that third day. And when he ascended, he takes his place as ruler, sovereign over all things. And here's the point, everyone who trusts in that victory, looks back to what Christ did, will be raised to new life as well. Will be delivered from Satan's tyranny, Satan's rule. We talked about that last week. Pastor Ted talked about that. We're free. We belong to Jesus. We belong to his kingdom and we belong forever. That's good news. That's the victory, the kind of victory that Jesus won. Jesus promised that one day as well, he would return He'll blot out evil completely. He'll cast Satan and his followers into eternal punishment, blot out completely and put all things to right in a new heaven and a new earth. Church, here's the point. Until Christ returns or until we go to be with him, we are to remember the triumph and keep fighting. Keep fighting. A few takeaways before we close. Okay, so let's, let's draw some application here. First, remember that you will need to fight. 
Okay? Don't be shocked by the fact that it's not easy. Don't be shocked by the fact that there will be enemies. Uh, Puritan Richard Sibbs, this quote's in your notes here, said it like this, there can be no victory where there is no combat. We're going to fight. That's just a fact. Okay, so the question becomes how. How do we fight? I'd like to help you with this and equip you for this fight. Um, you, first of all, well, two things. You need to know your enemy and know your resources. Know your enemy and know your, your weapons, so to speak. Okay, so let's take a look at this. The first enemy, what is it? Well, one of those enemies is sin, right? It's, it's the enemy within. It's, it's the flesh. Uh, the effects of our old sinful nature that still plagues us. It's the temptation to, to sin, the desires for sin. So what are the weapons in that fight? I love to give you three here. And this is, should be in your notes, or you can write these down. Reality, accountability, and activity. Okay, hopefully that's memorable. Okay, in, in, in the fight against the flesh and sin and temptation, we have the weapons of reality, accountability, and activity. Let me explain. First, we are to, in this fight, remember reality. Okay, and, and Pastor Ted reminded of us of this last week. The gospel says that in Christ, I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. In other words, sin is not my master anymore. As I trust in Jesus, listen, I can actually say no. I'm not powerless. I'm a new creation. Sin is not my master. As I trust in Christ, I can say no to sin. Okay, that's the first thing. Remember that reality. Remember the gospel. We fight from that victory. Second, accountability. Okay, so reality, accountability. Seek accountability. And what this means is simply bringing the hidden sin to light. It's, it's confessing it to others. Um, Steph has a discipleship group of, of ladies, and she's told me a number of times that she makes uh, the beginning of, of the, and the biggest part of that discipleship group a time for confession. We just, they just come together and, I mean, I've never listened in, but I'm assuming they just confess their sins to one another. And that's the big part of uh, their, their discipleship group is it's confession. And the other parts are encouragement and prayer and tough love. But you bring that sin into light and you get the help of others. Okay, so reality, accountability, last one, activity or, or righteous activity. Uh, how do you stop being so busy with sin? You make yourself busy with righteous work, with a righteous fight. You kill your sin and your flesh with kindness to others. Actively uh, busying yourself, fighting for the kingdom, fighting to build up the body. More on that in just a minute. Okay, so let me, let me just sum that up. Hopefully that's helpful. Fight against the flesh with the reality of the gospel with accountability with others, and with activity for the kingdom, okay? So that's the first enemy. What, what about another enemy here? Um, the second enemy is the world. The world, right? Outside influences. Uh, this includes that direct uh, persecution that we might face through, from the powers, uh, like our partner churches in Vietnam seem to be facing weekly, daily even. Or maybe just the way that the world system is set up against God, against truth, against goodness, against beauty. Well, one of the main weapons that we have to avoid being pressed into the mold of this wor world is God's own holy word, right? That's why we're listening to the preaching and proclamation and seeking to get into our Sunday school classes. We want to know the word of God, which shows us what is holy and what is just and what is good. And the spirit of God would empower us to live in ways that are holy and just and good. Listen to Romans 12 too. It tells us, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So that's, that's that weapon, that tool, as we engage God's word, his spirit renews our minds, changes our hearts so that we don't conform anymore to the rebellion and the pattern of the world. One more enemy. The Bible is clear in pointing out that the battle at, at, at its root is a spiritual one. The Bible uh, says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's truly a spiritual battle. So how do you fight that? How do you fight a spiritual battle? 
First, we fight on our knees. We fight on our knees. We, we pray. We lift up our hands to the heavens. Kind of that picture of Moses, right? We're not exactly sure that he was praying as he raised his hand of staff, but that's a great picture of prayer, isn't it? Regardless, stretching out our hands to God. God, this is our battle because you're the one who wins the victory. We fight on our knees as we pray. The Bible gives us more. Ephesians 6, well, we're not going to expound on all of that, but it, the full armor of God, that's for fighting the spiritual battle, right? And, and what it seems to say in Ephesians 6 is that as we prayerfully exercise uh, speaking and walking in the truth, exercise walking in righteousness, uh, proclaiming the gospel, taking um, God at his word, exercising faith, right? Um, having a, a firmer grasp on our salvation uh, as we grow in more knowledge of God's word, guess what? We'll be able to stand firm against those spiritual attacks. By the way, also, there's power in numbers, right? Together. That's, that's the point. Together. If Satan, like Amalek, prowls around like a roaring lion, right, picking off the outliers, well, then we must stay together, right? We, we must not neglect corporate worship and the assembly. We must not neglect true Christian community. When you find that no one in your church understands your heart and your mind, that's, in a, da that's a dangerous spot. Don't neglect true fellowship, true Christian community. By the way, that's what we're aiming for with Bible studies and small groups, community groups and discipleship groups. Okay, we want to know more of the Bible. We want to learn how to study it more. But we are also aiming at knowing one another's hearts, true Christian community. Um, I rec recommend you joining a group today. Go to the connection table, write down on one of those connection cards, I want to be a part of a community group or discipleship group. Let us know. More on that in just a bit. Okay, so first, remember that we need to fight and use those tools that God has given us together. All right, one more takeaway, and this is absolutely crucial. This is the idea of that banner, right? Remember that Jesus has won the victory. We fight from victory, not for it. Because this can get discouraging, right? And all this, all this battle, all, all the challenges, but you need to be reminded time and time and again that we're fighting from the victory that we have in Christ. It doesn't rest on me. Jesus is that true and better Moses. That picture of Moses stretching out his arms, right? But then faltering, is, is an interesting one. It reminds me of the way that Christ stretched out his arms on that cross until it was finished, never faltering. Or Joshua, right? Joshua, the conqueror. Well, Jesus is the true and better, right? He conquered Satan and sin and death, not just the, Am the Amalekites. We fight a battle, listen, that we can't lose. We fight a battle that we can't lose because Jesus has already won. And that's, that's our rallying point, right? That's our, that's our cry. That's our banner, the gospel. We need to keep that before us always, that Jesus has the victory, the victory of Jesus who saved us, made us a part of his people, his, his army, commands us out by his word. Okay, remember the banner. That's absolutely critical, absolutely crucial. All right, one more takeaway here. We need to fight the good fight together. That's kind of the obvious one, okay? But I see this playing out in, in our passage today. I see some instruction for us. Uh, first, we're to, I'm going to put it under the category of be helped. How do we fight together? Be helped. Um, here's what I'm trying to say. All of us will be Moses one day. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're wondering, how am I going to keep this up? I'm struggling. How much, I don't know how much longer I can, I can hold my hands up. Don't wait until someone asks you, go and ask for help, please. Share with someone. Ask for prayer. Be helped. Be a Moses in, in this case. Again, uh, that whole idea of community group, that's a cry to be helped. Uh, or come and talk to uh, one of the elders. Come talk to me after this message. Be helped. If you're um, a lady and you're, you feel more comfortable talking with a lady, please reach out to one of our deaconesses. They would love to talk to you, but that's the big idea. First, be helped, like Moses. Second, 
help. <laughs> help others. Uh, just as all of us will be a Moses someday, all of us in Christ are called to be an Aaron and a Her. Here's what I mean. We're called to hold up those in need, to help one another. So here's how. I'll make this plain. Seek one to know one another. That's kind of one of the hardest steps for some of us, for me. I'm not naturally wanting to just go out and meet everybody. And that might be a challenge for you, but that's our first way that we can help is just know. <laughs> know one another. And then through that knowing, we'll see that need and prayerfully seek to meet that need as God allows and to, to seek to rally the, the body of Christ around that need. Um, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Your first ministry as a member of the church is not parking, ushering, coffee, nursery, worship team, tear down, set up, teaching Sunday school. Okay, those are all good ministries that we need help with. But your first ministry as a member of the church is a covenant committed to grow in knowing, loving, and serving one another. That's the first ministry that you signed up for. That's your first commitment, to know others, to grow in your love for them, and then to serve them. And that will express itself in many different ways. It might be parking, it might be ushering, it might be coffee. But that's not your first. Your first is just to know people, to grow in your love for them, and to discern prayerfully how you might serve them. Um, I meet in a small discipleship group of men in downtown, call them the, the downtown group. Um, and every time I show up and spend time with them, they, they serve and minister to me and encourage my heart and my mind. They pray for me. I feel so refreshed. I feel so helped by them. Those brothers are being Aaron's and hers to me. And I'm seeking to be the same help to them. Finally, church, one, and I can't miss this application, and, and I want to take the opportunity to bang this drum again. We are called to unite as a church in prayer. Unite as a church in prayer. Um, this will be the only time. Get out your phone calendar and mark down October 6th, which is our, our church prayer service. Normally, I don't encourage phones out, but, uh, you know, do this. Go ahead. Mark that down on your calendar. Yes, we bang this drum over and over again. Join together in prayer. Join together in prayer. Um, and I've said it a number of different ways. I want to borrow uh, words from others to stress this point. First, um, we're, we need to unite as a church in prayer because corporate prayer together acknowledges what? That it's God's power. That we're powerless and that the only way we're going to win the battle is according to his own power. Uh, one Christian author wrote this. This should be in your notes. Don't ever forget, I love this, don't ever forget that you cannot do what God has called you to do. You cannot parent that child, love that husband, care for that elderly parent, submit to that boss, teach that Sunday school class, or lead that small group Bible study. God specializes in the impossible so that when the victory is won and the task is complete, we cannot take any credit. And if this is the case, then we have to pray and acknowledge that we are powerless, that it's impossible for us, but you can win the victory. Uh, second, we need to unite in prayer because the enemy wants us not to. <laughs> the enemy wants us not to unite in prayer, so what do we do? Well, we do it anyway, in your face. Listen to this. One pastor put it like this. If, as the hymn writer says, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees, then we may be sure that he and his minions will be working hard to discredit the value of united prayer. The evil one has scored a great victory in getting sincere believers to waver in their conviction that prayer is necessary and powerful. The enemy wants us not to. So guys, let's do it. Last one, third. We need to unite in prayer because prayer together is Powerful. Again, one of my favorite dudes, Charles Spurgeon, he wrote this. Why? See what accumulated force there is in prayer when one after another pours out his passionate desires, when many seem to be tugging at the rope, when many seem to be knocking mercy's gate, 
when the mighty cries of many burning hearts come up to heaven, when first one and then another and yet another throws his whole soul into prayer, the kingdom of heaven is conquered and the victory becomes great indeed. I love that picture. You know, if it's just me pulling on the rope, I'm going to get pulled in. But if it's many hands tugging at that rope to heaven, that's powerful. All right, so along the lines of fighting the good fight together, uh, next chapter, chapter 18, expands on this theme. But we're going to pause here and return to this, this theme of fighting together next week, Lord willing. But let me recap and close. In Christ, we fight a battle. I want to remind you that we cannot lose for an unfading prize that's been won for us. That's the focus. That's the banner. That's Christ. And so may each of us humbly exclaim one day with the Apostle Paul, listen, I've fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Looking forward to that day when we hear from the, the lips of our Lord and Savior, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's fight the good fight of faith together. Amen? Please stand. Let's close together. We continue in worship. Let's pray. Lord God, we are reminded that you have a perfect record when it comes to victory. You have never been defeated. You alone. You are the undefeated God of victory. In Christ, you have shown us that you have triumphed over all things, that it's as good as one, that Jesus is sovereign over all. All things are being subjected to him, put under his feet. And as your people saved by your grace through faith in Christ, Lord, we ask that you fill us with your spirit, that we wouldn't lose heart, that we would keep on fighting the good fight of faith, and that we would do that together. God, to, together, we pray together now that you would empower us to fight that fight. Empower us, God, to fight that fight. Bring our hearts together for the gospel that we would fight a good fight together. And may you receive all the glory.